chocolate. 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 From Dream Cacao, I'm Max Gandy, and this is Chocolate on the Road, the show where we explore hot topics surrounding cacao and chocolate cultures around the world. So let's hit the road. Our focus in today's episode is on... Oh, hold on. Sorry. Ah, yes. Our focus in today's episode is on social media and how it's changed the chocolate industry, one person at a time. At its core, social media has broken down the barriers to communication on a global scale. It's allowed the niche of craft chocolate to become a full-on movement, humanizing products, and speeding up the exchange of ideas. In the internet episode, we touched on how email was picking up in the 1980s, forums in the 1990s, and in the 2000s, social networking sites started popping up. But social media didn't really hit its stride until the 2010s. So now, in 2019, we can look back at a well-formed image of how those social media platforms allowed a smattering of individuals to become a single community. I was buying chocolate um, and doing tastings in earnest starting 2006 or so. And so I was already sourcing, for example, Patrick Chocolate and, you know, um, some of the very, very early craft makers at that time. Um, but by the time I opened in 2010, there was already beginning to be this growth that was occurring. I remember, um, I think that first summer, Dick Taylor, so um, Adam and Justin came to the chocolate garage. They were playing at a wedding and they were in town and they came over and they didn't quite have packaging. It was very sort of basic at the time, but they brought over some chocolate and wanted to talk chocolate. So even in that first summer of my opening, I believe it was 2010, maybe it was 2011, um, you know, there was already sort of that next um, wave of new makers, you know, that was far, far greater numbers um, in terms of a wave than the initial wave of, of makers that was like less than 10 at the time. That was Sunita de Torre founder of The Chocolate Garage, and one of three people I interviewed for today's show. Each guest had a very different opinion and definition of social media. How would you define social media? I find this a difficult question to answer um, because I feel like social media can be interpreted in a number of ways depending on on the account, you know, you you have social media for mainly for personal purposes, for just sharing bits and pieces of your life, usually the highlights. It's sort of personal marketing and branding. But I feel like businesses use it specifically for marketing purposes. Platforms that exist in theory for people to be able to share aspects of their life or business and connect with other human beings. That's the purported mission of these platforms. It's everything about the cocktail party on the internet. That is social media, minus the alcohol, if you do not want it. That was In Order, Hazel Lee, Sunida de Torre, and Estelle Tracy. Each woman has a different but somewhat related role in the chocolate industry. All of them act as connectors and chocolate educators in varying capacities. They work with both chocolate makers and chocolate consumers, but they also sell something of their own. I asked each of them similar sets of questions, and as you'd expect, I got very different answers. First up is Hazel Lee. Hazel is a chocolate consultant based in London, England. Her role in the craft chocolate industry is very much based in social media. So I started an Instagram account for personal use before I fell into the world of chocolate. And shortly after I started that account, I then fell into the world of chocolate and started posting pictures, making chocolate, visiting cocoa farms, chocolate bars that I tasted and discovered the hashtag bean to bar. And as I started posting more and following other accounts, my social media began to grow. And then I guess when I first started feeling successful at it was in 2015, when the Northwest Chocolate Festival based in Seattle 
uh, they emailed me saying, hey, would you be interested in working for us and helping us build our social media because we love your account? From that time, Hazel's online presence has only grown. And she's learned a lot about the impact social media can have from building up her own presence over the last half decade. I think in any case, you know, if people are posting more on social media, it's going to be good for, for any product that's being posted about, you know, as long as it's, it's positive. Um, so I feel like with craft chocolate, visual, the visual side of it is not the priority. Sometimes there are brands that are are not very out there with their packaging. And I think that the more successful brands regardless of what the chocolate tastes like and the quality, if you have, you know, very visual packaging, then it's going to stand out. People are going to post about it more. So I think those brands will have more success through social media than the sort of quieter brands with packaging. And I know that quite a few other people have shared their experience through selling and how the the most interesting and colorful packaging is what sells the most um and i think that some people some people don't think about that enough and obviously they focus on making the most incredible product but you do need a product that's instagrammable these days because that is just how the world works now it needs to be uh needs to be sexy <laughs> what do you think are the cons to this like, digital revolution to the heavy presence of social media and the heavy influence that social media the heavy pull of social media within the craft shop that i think the negatives of of social media and sort of marketing craft chocolate is that you can only really share very small points and it is very visual I mean speaking of Instagram specifically it's very visual often people don't read the full caption so it's more a way of communicating visually than through words and I know that with craft chocolate it probably isn't the most visual product I mean it just depends on how you style it and of course there's packaging and things so I think the downside is that it's hard to communicate the whole story because you've only got someone's attention for, you know, a second or so as they scroll past your post. And the whole thing with craft chocolate is that you need to slow down and appreciate it and really understand the full story. And I think that's the real struggle for a lot of people who work in craft chocolate. You know, the the overall goal of anyone involved in craft chocolate is that we we want more and more people to be aware of it, invest in it, and enjoy it and appreciate it. So the story of craft chocolate is a long one, and, and it's an investment to buy craft chocolate. And so people really need to understand why. And I think it's very hard to get the true story or the bigger picture through social media because social media is quite sort of fleeting. You have this beautiful picture, and then it goes through. Um, and I actually hope that, you know, the whole purpose of Taste with Colour and the workshops that I've been doing as well is to get people to really slow down and and appreciate the chocolate and see what the chocolate communicates with them. I get them to paint what they taste. And, it, and it, you know, they've just eaten a very tiny bit of chocolate, but it's kind of kept them occupied for an hour. And they see chocolate in a whole different way. So that's one way of really trying to slow it down. And so sometimes sharing the pictures of what people have enjoyed um, can portray that. But I think that's something that's still really difficult to get to, you know, the real story. So like social media as a tool to get people to actually try the chocolate, because once they try it, for the most part, depending on the maker, but for the most part, once they try it, they'll understand that, wow, like this is different and I need to interpret this differently. Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like it's not easy to do that, though. I feel like it's difficult to get people to invest because the price of craft chocolate versus a candy bar in in the supermarket 
is is massive. It's a really big difference. People aren't used to spending, you know, ten dollars on a chocolate bar when they're used to buying, you know, Hershey or Cadbury. So I feel like it takes a lot of convincing and I don't think, you know, a social media post here and there can can be enough to persuade them. They have to taste the chocolate themselves, have someone sit down and really explain where this has come from, why it's different. And I feel like you can't get that much information into social media because there are other people who, you know, I have friends who say, who talk about, oh, this is amazing chocolate. This is delicious. And so, you know, and then I see them again and I ask, have you bought that? And and most of the time it's no, as much as I'm disappointed by that. That's the truth. It takes a lot of work to get people to invest in it. So I feel like I'm not sure how, but. It'd be great if there was some more if there were some more tools to be able to get that across in social media because it takes a lot of convincing. Convincing people to pay more for chocolate takes an immense amount of work. Some would say it's even a numbers game, but I think it's not just how many people we talk to about chocolate, but how we talk to them. Hazel actually designed a tool to teach consumers about tasting consciously. Originally, I designed it to be a tool to help me identify flavors in chocolate because sometimes I struggle to find the flavor notes when I'm tasting chocolate. And I've had various tools in front of me when judging chocolates and tasting chocolates with friends. And seeing the words in front of me helps prompt me to realize, oh, that's what I'm tasting. But through my experience of tasting chocolate, I noticed that I also saw colors. And I would explain flavors by saying, oh, it tastes very red to me or this tastes quite green. And so I realized that there isn't a product out there currently that separates the flavors by color. And that's all it is that I've designed. It's very simple. It's a simple but effective tool. It's also beautiful and really gets people curious. If you'd like to get a flavor map of your own, you can visit Hazel's Instagram at hazelchalk or click the link in the show notes. I have no doubt that the flavor map has turned many a chocolate lover into a craft chocolate lover. But it's not just about the tools. It's about the people using those tools. My name is Sunita de Touré, and I started The Chocolate Garage, which is a community gathering space for customers, as well as a platform for makers and for, generally speaking, the industry. The Chocolate Garage started in Palo Alto, California in 2010, before most social media networks became international platforms. So I first asked Sunita about how our personal and business relationships with social media have evolved. I think that I always felt that Twitter and Facebook were effortful. I never quite could figure out, like I was never inspired to post on there. I kind of had to think about it and and force myself to. And when Instagram came about, that felt like a more fluid um, space for me because it was always picture as the starting point. And then I would flow from there and write stuff about um, about the picture. So personally for me, that felt a lot more satisfying because there was something that inspired me to say a bunch of things and this was an image and then I would like express things. So I feel like at that point with Instagram, that's when I started like really effortless to use this particular type of social media. Not everyone finds social media to be an effortless or even useful aspect of their business. It's all about finding the right balance for you. It's more the uh, the actual content and how you engage your your customers and what's compelling to them and whether whether you actually care about um, being compelling to the most people or whether it's about a true expression of what you want to put out there. So the idea of like, you know, in your previous question, you asked like, when did you start feeling successful at it? If ever, um, I think that's a really interesting question. And, and, um, it gets into the question of like, is social media important for your business? And my personal experience is that if I look at where the overlap was of my customers, you know, my, my best customers who are loyal and who buy lots of chocolate and keep us in business and who are my people on social media, the, the intersection of those two, um, Venn diagrams is very slim. Um, 
to me, at least the platforms I use the most, Instagram, were actually more for industry folks and for um, people who were geeky and curious about chocolate and trying to learn, and they weren't my customers. So arguably that's important as well, but it wasn't important for me for selling. I think that social media is an interesting thing, and I think that um, I try to be really aware of why I'm posting what I'm posting. Um, it's very easy to like observe what's going on on social media platforms and see where all the likes are or where the comments are and like how to get lots of comments and likes and to start trying to craft your message for that. Um, and I think that, you know, more and more social media is becoming this marker of your relevance, you know, your, your business relevance, your social, your human relevance. And so, um, it's also, these tools are built to be extremely addictive to the user, which means the poster, you know, if you're posting, you're also like looking at what the comments are and the likes and all. And so I don't know, I, I, I'm very wary of it. I mean, I don't think it's a great use of my, I don't think it used to be a great use of my time in terms of actual sales. Um, I don't think that what it actually built for me was really very important in terms of like the operation of my business. Um, and so, um, I have tried over the years to let it be a space for posting what's real to me, posting the difficulties of running a business, talking about the challenges, you know, Friday night, 11 PM, I'm knee deep in chocolate boxes and packaging because I'm preparing for the next day. Like I like to post those things, even though like that's not what we typically post on social media. We post cute pictures of ourselves, nice pictures of chocolate, aesthetically beautiful, you know, all of that. And I, on a personal level, I, I find that more alienating and isolating for human beings, um, than, than is already sort of the baseline state. So I, I try not to participate in that or I try to post stuff that's true for me and let it be in terms of like, how many likes there are, how relevant it is um, to the larger world. So I don't know, I have a very different relationship with social media because I'm trying to keep my own connection to social media healthy. Um, it's just too, I mean, these, these, these tools, I'll say again, are designed to maximize, you know, our time spent on it and to maximize, you know, the success of the platform. And so these are, I don't mean that lightly, like they're designed in a way that make them extremely addictive. And, um, I try to be cognizant of that and not, um, and not get sucked in and not be part of the sucking in mechanism. How, or if at all, have you seen social media itself change and shape craft chocolate industry? It seems to me that Social media maybe just exacerbates something that already was, which is make the marketing and the branding and the advertising uh, more important, um, more important period and more important than the product because um, it's what sells something unless you already know the brand and have tasted it. Um, so I think that it's just sort of exacerbated something that already was true. Um, that the folks with those skills, it's actually preferable to have skills in that area than it is to, you know, really be able to thoughtfully run a business and produce the best chocolate. That's not enough. It's not enough to do that. You have to um, not just get your packaging down now. You need to also build a relationship and, you know, engage with your customers on social media. And I think that or the smaller operations or the operations that are really like have this notion that if you make the best chocolate out there, that it, that will be enough or it will be recognized. Um, I think that, um, you know, it further shapes things in terms of like who is going to be the most successful and, you know, who's going to be able to network and market and connect and partner and, you know, do all that social media stuff. Um, those folks are going to have a leg up over, um, other folks who might just be quietly plotting away and making great chocolate and not so good at, at the, the connecting with humans and marketing and advertising their product. It just seems like there's a lot of noise these days. In some ways, like we think that, oh, we're also connected and stuff. But there's so much noise. 
And I think social media helps with that noise and that, you know, people can post all kinds of beautiful things and say nice stuff and whatever, but it's not really a measure of who they are or what their chocolate's like or how reliable they are or any of that, right? And so in some ways, it's, it's a lot more clutter. It's harder to, it's even more complicated in some ways to build relationships and establish trust and, and um, so many players too. Um, and people are more fickle. So, um, I mean, not on all sides, you know, like the buyers as well, the makers were buying the cacao and wanting to have new products to launch for their customers and doesn't end up being really about long-term relationships with the producers because you always want to turn out new things. And also on the other side, someone else comes along and offers to buy up all your production for a price that's nice for you, then you don't necessarily, you know, honor the relationship you built with someone else. So I don't know. It's just the trend of our world these days too. Just like, you know, that throat, look out for yourself. <laughs> don't build relationships. <laughs> Um, short term, short sighted. There's going to be a reckoning. There's been a lot of excitement and passion and, you know, legitimate in many ways, you know, excitement and passion on the parts of, of makers and producers and, and almost like a bubble in a sense in terms of, um, uh, excitement around this, this like segment of the industry. It's kind of like a gold rush in some ways, but. I feel like, you know, it's a period of time right now where it's a real boom, you know, like there's so much growth and excitement and passion and people leaving their old jobs and getting excited and moving into chocolate and living their dream and all. And um, there isn't enough like thoughtfulness going into um, how this works long term. And and I, I'm most concerned because I think that I'm most concerned for the the origin, you know, because there's all these folks who are really figuring out often under pretty difficult circumstances and poor infrastructure and um, limited resources. They're figuring out how to like better ferment and build better sort of systems to get to make better cacao because there's this really, you know, interesting price for higher price for the cacao if they're able to do that. Um, and then you have all these new makers and just such this, this burgeoning of lots and lots and lots of small makers using very small amounts of cacao. and um, I'm concerned about the long term and how that that kind of falls out over time, um, and also how that changes in terms of like the values. You know, there's this idea of of like um, being really inspired to be part of something that's about creating change in the world. But after five years of slogging away at it, um, if you haven't built it in a way that was thoughtful, I think it's very easy to fall into this place where you're like, gosh, you know, I really like, I need to get paid. I need this to work better. You know, what do I do? And if you take the traditional business rules, like most of the rules you apply on how to make that work better involve, you know, scaling and getting more efficient and looking carefully at all the costs. And then you start whittling away at what you're paying the farmer or trying to find cacao that's cheaper. And, and then all of a sudden I, I'm concerned we eventually get to this place where we, have really watered down what the original um, meaning or inspiration uh, was for craft chocolate. You know, it's about this radically different product in terms of quality and taste um, and price. And then it's also about a different relationship with farmers and a different relationship to this whole supply chain, making it not extractive and exploitative and just about taking raw product and, you know, adding all the value at the end. So I'm, I'm concerned that that, you know, that that may happen over time and that we're really poised and sort of set up for that. This origin-centric approach to chocolate is what entices many chocolate lovers to the fine flavor side. Being able to taste the flavor of a place can really draw in consumers. So losing that aspect of the industry would be completely devastating. Much like Hazel's flavor map, presenting chocolate by origin is a way to introduce the food's potential to consumers. I'm Estelle Tracy. I'm originally from France. I've lived in the U.S. since 2002. And I am a, a writer and a chocolate educator. Estelle is one of the people who was convinced of chocolate's power by the variety of flavors she experienced from different bars. What started as a fun way to celebrate her 37th birthday became the blog 37chocolates.com, 
and a side business running the occasional chocolate tasting in her town. Before chocolate, Estelle was, and continues to be, a food writer. She's been using social media for that business basically since it came out. But social media in the chocolate community has proven itself to be different. It's a much less developed industry. So one of the first questions I asked Estelle was how she defined success on social media and how others can be successful. One day, uh, Will from WM Chocolate sent me a message to say, well, you know, I have changed the front of my wrappers because of what you said. So to me, that is success. To me, that's success. I use a platform to share an idea. That idea came to a person who took action. So that is success, right? So, um, so for me, that's something in chocolate that is really important. To me, it comes down to, okay, I'm a business owner and this is a tool I have to promote my business and my product. So some people I find don't exactly know what to do with like Instagram or like Facebook or they go on the platform because they feel like they have to. I mean, the skill is really, um, I, 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 I don't. I, it's a skill in that, yes, there are some technicalities for sure. You need to learn like how to use some of the analytics and like, you know, um, decide, you know, how to touch, like, you know, to, to, um, edit a photo. So yeah, you, you do have those skills. But after that, I find that if you put yourself in the shoes of your customer, if you put yourself in the shoes of the person consuming your content, I do think it makes it easier to know what to post, how to post it, and which um, which type of writing you want to share. So in that, like, I, I think it's a skill in empathy for me. So you've been in craft chocolate, or you've been paying attention to craft chocolate for about three and a half years now. Have you, and in what ways have you seen social media change or evolve within craft chocolate? Today, compared to three years ago, I find um, more people are more chocolate enthusiasts are sharing their chocolate finds, and it's and it's really for me. It's really I'm always looking for new chocolate bars. Like what's you know what's a talented maker who does great work with each bar that's the kind of makers i'm looking for like i'm always trying to keep up with that and you know i follow so many instagram like chocolate enthusiast instagram accounts like you know my year in chocolate you know trish victoria coxie and you know time to eat chocolate or your actually your account too like and i really i really like seeing what people um, what's, what I keep seeing on different people's accounts. And that helps me figure out where to spend my money. Um, and I don't remember having connected with so many people three and a half years ago. Um, that's for me, um, that's one thing I, I see them. I, I really see. Um, now in terms of like Instagram account, for instance, of like chocolate makers, um, I'm not sure I see different, like more of a difference in how it's handled, but I also know that I don't look at those accounts as much as used to. So I think my use has changed and what I really, really like and what I recommend to people who want to find good bars is really look at those Instagram accounts from the chocolate enthusiasts to narrow down their selection. And I think that's a very valuable resource for the chocolate enthusiast. Consumers are telling makers what they want. Sometimes these are conflicting ideals, but it's important to reconcile the two without losing the craft in craft chocolate. Do we think that making craft chocolate is a skill? You know, is it something that you know, the idea of something that's a craft. Um, I always think of this example of like, I can't remember, it's just a particular type of fermented drink, you know, Japanese fermented drink. I can't remember what it is. It's not like an obvious one like sake, but like, how do you learn that craft? You know, you study for 10 years under a master 
And then at some point when you think you're ready, you go and make your own batch of it. And then you have to serve it up to the master. And then the master decides whether it's okay or not. And if it's not, you can't start making that product. If it is, you can start making that product. You're like, you've graduated and you're like, there's none of that. Like I could go get a, you know, a premiere and some, you know, print out some labels and start selling chocolate, um, you know, within a few months. Um, it doesn't mean I, I have any sense of like the, the technical aspects, the, you know, all of the, the intricacies of roasting, of choosing the right beans, the first and most critical step, you know, like that's, that's a thing that's changed so much for sourcing beans, right? People, I don't think chocolate makers necessarily have to be the evaluators of the beans. It's like, oh, well, you just buy from Uncommon or Meridian or Alchemy and like there's an availability of beans. Um, makers who, who started pre that time had to evaluate, you know, hundreds of samples and figure out what they could work with. And most of it they couldn't work with. I remember, maybe this was in the podcast, Alan said, like, I remember him saying to me, 98% of what I taste every year is unacceptable. 98%. This was, within the past, I don't know, seven years or so. Um, so, you know, there's someone who's trained in having had to evaluate cacao because there was only little jewels within the large sea of commodity cacao. Um, nowadays, it's like, whatever, you go on there, it's like shopping online. Like, oh, well, what origin do I want now? And you click on what you want from Chocolate Alchemy and source it. And, um, you know, and not to, to bang on Chocolate Alchemy at all, um, it's just like that's the situation that we're in right now. And that's that's what it's like so easy now that pretty much anyone can start making chocolate and get sucked in and then start trying to turn it into a business. Um, but the idea that there's like skill and understanding and know how and if something goes wrong that you know what went wrong and you can tweak that section of the of the process, like it feels like a bit of a crapshoot. I mean, that might get me into hot water to say that. <laughs> No, but, but I agree. <laughs> I just, I realize when I have the few bars I have on hand that are really good chocolate, I'm like, oh, this is, this is what really good chocolate tastes like. The stuff I've had 90% of what I have is either bad, okay, or good. Bad, okay, and good are not exactly rousing endorsements. Social media has made it much easier for me to learn of and get my hands on new chocolate. It allows us all to connect and see the humans behind our food. But when we get too focused on how something looks, we can forget the craft of craft chocolate. And I don't know about you, but only the best bars from my stash make it with me on the road. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chocolate on the Road. If you liked it, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes and share it in any way you see fit. Your support means so much as it keeps me motivated to continue sharing the stories and experiences of a range of amazing guests. An especially huge thank you to Hazel, Sunita, and Estelle for being in this episode. To learn more about our guests, check out the show notes of this episode in the link in the description or on my website at damecacao.com. That's D-A-M-E-C-A-C-A-O dot C-O-M. Have a wonderful day, and I hope you'll join me next time we go on the road. <laughs>